In this video, we take a look at input devices. An input device is any device that allows you to pass information from the outside world into a computer system. On the screen now is a range of the most common input devices which you are probably familiar with. Now there are literally thousands of different input devices. The exam board has specified eight in particular that you need to know about and they can question you about in the exams. These are barcode scanners, digital cameras, keyboards, microphone, optical mouse, QR scanners, three different types of touchscreens and both two-dimensional and three-dimensional scanners. A quick note from the exam board before we get into the main part of this video. This is a section of the syllabus that's been greatly simplified for the exams taking place from the summer of 2023 onwards. In the old syllabus, candidates need to know details of how each input device operates. For example, how an input device scans a barcode and the process involved in converting that into digital data. However, now you only need to know what each device does, why it does it, and when it might be used. There are still many textbooks, revision books, and online videos that go into far too much depth about how each device physically functions, and you're not going to be examined on the material. So let's have a look at each device now. We'll start with a barcode scanner. Now, despite the fact you don't need to know the technical, physical intricacies of how it works, we will very briefly describe what each device does so we can set some context. So with a barcode scanner, it shines a red laser at a barcode to illuminate it. The white lines reflect the light back, whereas the black lines absorb some of the light and reflect less. The strength of the reflection from each line is interpreted by a microprocessor and converted into a binary value. It's typically used for scanning goods at supermarket checkouts, checking library books in and out, and also used for tracking packages that are out for delivery. There's many advantages to using barcode scanners in this way. In a supermarket situation, it means we have faster checkout queues. There's reduced need for manual input, thus reducing errors created by humans. If we're tracking an item using a barcode, we can have more detailed tracking information, and it allows for things like automatic stock control. Next up, we have digital cameras. So as light enters the camera, it falls onto a sensor made up of millions of squares or pixels. Each pixel measures the light intensity, and a microprocessor converts these values into digital data representing color values. So digital cameras these days are typically integrated into almost all smartphones. Professional photographers can use dedicated high-end cameras. And digital cameras are also used in many security and surveillance systems. They've largely replaced traditional film-based cameras. They allow for instant photographs, images and movies, and there's no development time required. With a digital camera, photos can be easily transmitted via Wi-Fi and Bluetooth. And typically embedded software allows us to adjust or touch up the photographs straight away, applying filters, red eye removal and other features. Our next input device is the keyboard. So traditional and mechanical keyboards operate slightly differently, but in essence, they all achieve the same results. Each character on a keyboard has a corresponding character set value. The key presses are converted into a digital signal, which the computer then interprets. So they're connected to most desktop computers via USB connection or wireless or Bluetooth. They're built into laptops and items such as tablets and smartphones often make use of virtual keyboards. They're obviously one of the most common forms of text-based data input. Next up is the optical mouse. Now this uses a red LED and a sensor to determine the movement of the mouse relative to the surface beneath. 
once again a microprocessor, analyzes both the speed and distance of the movement and replicates this on screen via a virtual cursor. They're used for navigation and interaction with almost all elements of a graphical user interface. They allow for easy interaction with applications and other GUI elements. They have no moving parts, unlike the older mechanical mice, so are more reliable. And there's also no need with an optical mouse for a special surface, i.e. a mouse mat. Next up are microphones. So vibrations caused by sound waves cause a coil to move around a magnet, resulting in electromagnetic field changes. These tiny changes are converted by a microprocessor and an analog to digital converter into a digital representation of the sound. Microphones clearly have many typical uses. From making music recordings to dictation, they're used in radio, TV and films, telephone calls, security, and video-based forms of online communication. Why are they required? Well, they capture any real-world sound and store it as a digital approximation. Once stored, the digital sound can then be further adjusted and modified. Next up are QR code scanners. So QR codes are read using a camera typically embedded into a mobile device. An app then processes the image, converting the squares into readable data. They have many uses, but typically they can be used for advertising products, providing quick links to websites without the need to type in the URL, sharing contact details instantly, and providing access to electronic travel passes and event tickets. QR codes hold far more information than traditional barcodes. Traditional barcodes can include up to 30 digits, whereas a QR code can encode up to 4,296 characters or over 7,000 digits. Next up, we have touchscreen technology. Now, touchscreens are both input and output devices, although as far as the exam board are concerned, they'll refer to them as an input device. They've become an incredibly popular way of receiving user input, replicating the same functions as a mouse. Now, there are three main types of touchscreen technology that you need to know about, capacitive, infrared and resistive. As you no longer need to know how each of these technologies work in detail, we'll just briefly go over the main differences. So a resistive touchscreen consists of two conductive layers of which the top layer is flexible. The two layers are separated by some kind of air gap or insulating layer. When the upper layer is pressed, the two layers connect, completing a circuit. With infrared touchscreens, LEDs shine an infrared matrix across a screen. When the screen is touched, the beams are interrupted and the point where the beams are interrupted determines the position of the touch. Capacitive touchscreens are composed of a protective layer, a transparent conductive layer and a glass substrate. Touching the screen with a bare finger or a special stylus peripheral changes the electrost electrostatic field of the conductive layer. At the point where this occurs is the point where the screen has been touched. So starting with resistive screens, they're cheap to produce and they can be activated with virtually any object, finger, stylus, a gloved hand, and they're very resistant to surface contaminants. However, they do have a lower image clarity and a precision compared to the other two. You typically find these at use in cash machines, information kiosks and medical equipment. Next up, we're going to look at capacitive. Now, these provide excellent image clarity and very high precision. The durable screen also allows for multiple touches of the screen at the same time. However, they do require a bare finger or a capacitive stylus for activation. 
These are the screens you'll be most familiar with from tablets, laptops and smartphones. Finally, we have infrared. Now this provides excellent image quality and it has an unlimited touch life and these physically scale in size very well. However, they are sensitive to interference from ambient light, water and snow, etc. They can be used for very large scale commercial displays, for example, at concerts on the side of roads. They're also much like resistive screens often found in use at kiosks and medical equipment. Lastly, we have two dimensional and three dimensional scanners. So a 2D or flatbed scanner shines a bright light across a document to measure the levels of reflected light and creates a digital version of it. Whereas a 3D scanner shines a laser light over the surface of an object to record its geometry and dimensions to create a digital model of it. So 2D scanners are used for creating digital versions of documents and photographs and can also be used for things like reading passports at airport security. 3D scanners are used to create 3D models for use, say, with computer aided design software or for creating maybe a working replica with a 3D printer. They're used in things like dentistry, product development, quality inspection and research. They're both a simple and cheap, effective way of generating a digital representation of 2D or 3D objects for then further manipulation. That's quite a lot of information there. We've summarised everything over the next two screens. So pause the video and take some notes.